welcome to Writing for Psychology featuring Jane Hallinan along with me, Garth Newfeld. This seven-part psych session series features conversations around topics related to writing in psychology, from finding opportunities to finding inspiration and so much more. Quite simply, this was my personal attempt to learn something from one of the masters in our field and to share it with you, our audience. We hope you enjoy it. All right, Jane, I've got some difficult things to say to you right now. Um, I'm I'm uh, going to give you some feedback here. Uh, how are you feeling? <laughs> how are you feeling about that? Um, <laughs> it already gives me willies. Saw your face drop for just a quick second before, before you you knew where I was going. But uh, I think when we talk about uh, withstanding feedback, and I love how you wrote that uh, as as kind of a part for this episode. Uh, there is this uh, there is this protective layer you have to have uh, about feedback, and I know that when when we talk about feedback, we're gonna immediately at least I am gonna go to my students as the first example, but I'd like to hold that uh, for our, maybe our next conversation where we talk about students explicitly. Uh, what does feedback look like for, uh, for writers or for psychologists who are writing for uh, psychology? That's a big question because it's very dependent on who the audience is, what kind of writing you're doing. So if you are writing for professional scholarly journals, then of course the feedback that you're going to get ultimately is an up or down judgment on whether or not someone thinks what you've written has value. That's um, certainly a powerful form of feedback. But for the most part, along the way, your reviewers will provide feedback about the things that you've done well, but more likely they'll provide feedback on the things that you've messed up or could have done better at. And so I think when I suggested withstanding feedback as the title, it was in part because I think it's important to communicate, especially to people who are relatively new at writing in the discipline, to get ready and add that protective layer because if you're going to submit your work to uh, reviewers, chances are good, you're going to get reviewer number two. (laughs) And this is the legendary mythical person who apparently lives to criticize every single factor of what could be found in the article. And that is very painful to be on the receiving end of someone who is brutal in their feedback. But it is it's pro forma. It is fairly standard, even in the most humane editing processes, for you to encounter the person who doesn't really know how to give feedback that helps people develop, but instead is feedback that comes from a place of showing you that I'm the smartest person in the room. Right. Uh, Reviewer number two, the smartest person in the room. The smartest person in the room. And, you know, there, there are these... Uh, stories that uh that i've heard probably some people who are kind of in like later career in teaching of psychology who say the reason i came to stp is because i kept running into reviewers number two (laughs) that person at conferences or uh that that kind of critiquer um now there is there can be something really valuable i have people in my life who don't come across as that really warm kind person who are extremely critical and they are also they, that really has sharpened me as well and so um but i think where what i'm hearing you say is um well and we've talked about this protective layer is that it's super vulnerable <laughs> to put your work out there and many people have to do it for promotion and tenure or something like that. It's just part of your job. Uh, But how, again, what kind of, uh, what kind of advice do you have for people who are putting their self themselves out there who are going to get the reviewer number two? Do you take it with a grain of salt? Do you learn what you can? You, you know, you eat the chicken and spit out the bones. What do you, what do you do? 
That was a very vivid uh, example metaphor. Yeah. I like that. I think uh, to ensure that you reduce the impact of reviewer number two, it helps if you have, and this is especially for people who are just starting out, it helps if you vet your writing with people you trust before you submit the writing. So finish your article and then ask a trusted colleague to look at it and to get feedback from someone uh, who isn't in that position of authority over your writing and can be much more developmental and helpful. I think that's a, a good suggestion. Uh, that may circumvent some of the things that reviewer number two would have crabbed about. I think it also helps if you recognize that um, criticism in our culture, in academic culture, tends largely to be thought of as find the negatives. And so if you're not getting rosy compliments about what you've done and in publishing, even in STP related activities, there may not be a lot of, wow, you really knocked it out of the park with this one, uh, that people are attempting to help you improve what you're doing. But sometimes it, the manner in which it's done may be uh, harsher than it needs to be. I sometimes wish we could run workshops on, you know, how do you give feedback that people can grow from? Because it's, uh, it, it can be done. You can tell the truth, but there are ways that you can also soften. Um, I know your intention was good, but have you thought about is different than, wow, you really lost it on the, you know, that there, there's a qualitative way that feedback can be done that is easier. So uh, encouraging people telling them as they begin to publish, do get ready because the reviewer number two out there is gunning for you. It doesn't really matter what, what you have to say. Um, and within that, there may in fact be some really good suggestions. But in the process of doing scholarly writing for uh, journals, typically you're gonna have a set of three reviews, two or three reviews. And if you get that cranky reviewer number two, notice that that's going to be a bit of an outlier from the other two individuals. And so you can attribute some of the harshness to a, a negative evaluation bias that some professionals have. And that allows you to, to sort of put it on the side. Look, look for what is actually useful in the writing. Um, defend to the best of your ability, what it is you're going to change or not change, and then look for shoring up support from the other two reviewers. Um, and, and I think there's an object lesson here for reviewers, which is that we should not be trying to bleed all over everybody's work, recognizing how much is at stake for people in tenure and promotion, that it is reasonable to be able to say something positive about what you've read. And let, you know, if the article is just awful, and I've read some just awful ones as a reviewer, uh, then it's best to be able to be brief and say, this simply needs more work. I would recommend you look at X, Y, and Z. Um, but not go to the level of the editing detail that will probably be lost on someone because of how crushed they feel in response to such overwhelming negative sentiment being expressed by a reviewer. Yeah. Uh, I've been a reviewer too. And, uh, you know, I didn't come through, um, uh, like I didn't come through a program where I was writing a lot. And so to do and, and not publishing and, and that's not part of my job description at a community college. But um, as I've gotten into reviewing, I've, I've realized uh, that it, well, it shocks me how bad some things can be. In fact, I've got to, I got to kind of reflect on this a little bit earlier in this series you talked about how and, and from time to time how how bad writing can be in psychology and i think you even made it kind of more alarming than that but i don't know that i really connected with that until we are, are having this conversation i realized oh my goodness yeah i have seen some stuff that were, was submitted that was submitted to a journal for publication um and 
And that stuff was not good. <laughs> now there are some really good things that come, but um, yeah, I, I'm not sure who's let down these folks at, at some point that uh, well, and maybe that's not the, the question I, I want to ask. I think maybe the question is how, okay, here's a question. When I am submitting, if I have, if I've worked on something and I'm submitting it to a journal, should I expect that it will be published? No, but uh, I'm rejection. But I'm really smart. <laughs> yes, I know you are. But no, uh, rejection rates being what they are, it's unlikely that a first submission is going to get a thumbs up from people. It's very rare that that ha- it's very rare that that happens. Um, as well, I think one of the things that contributes to people not being successful in publishing. And I don't know if this is a training flaw or what, but the idea that you target a journal and submit your article to that journal when you don't read that journal. So the voice that you bring to your article clearly doesn't match the voice that is standard for the, the journal itself. And there's, a, I think, an interesting litmus test that new writers can use, which is, are you citing any articles that the journal has published in your reference list? And if you aren't, are you, are you trying to publish in the right place? So you need to, uh, you need to, be a careful reader of the journal that you're submitting to, to understand here are the values, here's how these people talk. Uh, It communicates a lot about who the audience is. And I don't think anyone ever taught me that explicitly, but I think I figured it out um, when I saw a reviewer's comment to someone else saying, you didn't even use any uh, article citations from the journal that you're applying to. What, What are you thinking? Like, oh, Gosh, um, there's a lot packed in that statement for helping people figure out how to, to um, do a better job of finding the right outlet for their ideas. Yeah, I think you just blew some people's minds, including my own right here, uh, which is, of, of course, that's obvious uh, now. <laughs> now yeah. that you've said it, it's really obvious uh, that, that that's exactly how you should approach it. Uh, I know that there are... Uh, in, for example, uh, scholarship of teaching and learning or, or, or teaching of psychology, that some authors uh, get into those publications quite regularly. And it's probably not because all of their ideas are so great. Um, I mean, I'm sure that's probably part of it, but they've also hacked the system a little bit and they know what gets in. Whereas those of us who are on, on the outside, uh, we are trying to get in, but the feedback in, in some ways is going to tell, tell us um, what you've written is, it, it may come across as it is, and I think, what did you say that at the beginning? It doesn't have value, <laughs> but it doesn't have value here right now in this journal. I think that's Correct. really important to brace ourselves for if we're just kind of like, you know, shotgun, uh, you know, submitting to a bunch of different journals. Yeah, I think good. especially for the journals that we tend to write for, teaching of psych and scholarship of teaching and learning in psychology, uh, sometimes new writers believe if they have an experience in their class, if they just write it up, <clears throat> then obviously people will want to learn about that. So no, not obviously, unless there's some sort of object lesson involved in what you did that is generalizable. That's not anything that has value per se, or if it doesn't have data attached to it, that has that, that's a challenge. Uh, Personal experience, I mean, in psychology, one of our tenets is not to trust personal experience, right? So we're looking to have more and more of what we publish be empirical um, and uh, data-based. So I think understanding that, those criteria, that value for the journal will make you a better submitter and mean that you get less really hostile negative feedback from people. I, I'm thinking about uh, graduate students or early career folks who are going to be, um, you know, sending things off and, and then, you know, getting 
uh, getting feedback from from these journals and how much a good mentor probably uh, plays a role in producing people who are going to not only uh, be able to take feedback more constructively, but also um, be able to uh, just produce something that where, where the, the feedback maybe won't be so harsh. So what role does mentoring play, do you think, for uh, you know, early career or, or graduate school or, or graduate students in psychology? I, I think it's invaluable to have a mentor who can help you understand an insider's view of what's going on. And I was newly um, sensitized to that in one of my most recent projects that I did with uh, Missy Beers. She and I took on one of my undergraduates who wanted to go into writing in psychology. So I said, okay, we'll give you some practice. You can be part of the writing team. And <clears throat> having to explain the steps of what we were doing, why we were doing it, um, here, we're, now we're moving into the review stage. You need to get ready because not everyone's going to think we're as smart as we do. Uh, that that process was really helpful in, in helping the student understand the nature of the discipline, but also reminding me how different it is to be on the more expert end than the novice end. The novice end, you know, if I've got a good idea, somebody, need, somebody should be able to read it when it is a very complex process that ends up uh, allowing a good idea to be read by other people. Well, thank goodness we're teachers and we can, we, we know how to pull people under our wings to, to convey that. I can imagine that in different areas, in different disciplines um, that because that uh, maybe that teaching component isn't there, uh, that there maybe, maybe the feedback is even uh harder or the, the developmental road is even harder for becoming a, a good writer who can withstand feedback. And, and I'd say maybe this is the other thing is put together a product that's not going to get so much harsh feedback. So, um, right. yeah. So, you know, for people who love teaching, uh, we can, we can mentor. And I, I would say even, even now it's a pleasure for me to, uh, work with my more senior national colleagues on writing projects and to see how this process works, even at a high level. Um, and, and maybe that's the, that maybe that's the best thing for, uh, for a career is to make sure that there's somebody a little bit ahead of you who can show you, uh, show you the ropes because there's, there always seems to be new ropes, um, new, new things to do in our, in our, um, little area that you're going to get feedback on. So it's not, not only limited to, uh, to, to writing, uh, for, you know, a journal, it's also, uh, limited or it's also, it also includes maybe putting something out for uh, a conference and getting rejection from the conference, which again, I think a lot of things that you're talking about really apply there. Uh, have you ever been rejected from a, from a conference? <laughs> Yes, recently actually. Uh, shall I name names who the no. rejectors? Were? Uh, because uh, I, unfortunately, uh, when I submitted to a conference that I won't name, but is very dear to our hearts, and got rejected, the grief that I got from our colleagues about you got rejected. And yeah. I, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, and I, I, I think. Uh, Name recognition, whatever. I don't know. Uh, I was a little surprised that what I put in got rejected, <laughs> but I understand that uh, some someone somewhere decided that it didn't fit in contrast with the other things that did get accepted. And so uh, I'm a big girl and I put my big girl pants on and dealt with it. But I, I will say I sure had a lot of grief from my colleagues about that. Yes, you did. Yes, you I did. I did. It was bad. Yeah. So I don't know. What was that? So without your colleagues, even that I know that was disappointing. Um, and and I think maybe as you get further into your career, and you have so much more knowledge. I think it's rarer, actually, once mm -hmm. you figure out these systems and what, you know, and, the, and your own voice. So, you know, you have this example uh, and I have one, too, of, of a recent rejection. Um, but, you know, your, your 
the the title here was with withstanding feedback. So how do you process that? Because obviously you don't, you're Jane Hallen and you've written for a long time. You've proposed a lot of things. You've given a lot of talks and it's not like you're going to uh, wallow and say, well, I'm good for nothing now. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's not, that's not how you feel about it, but how do you withstand feedback? Well, in the case of the rejection, um, I remember looking at it and thinking, huh, well, that's different. Uh, Not what I was expecting. And then with a second wave, I thought, well, I don't have to get it ready. And so there was a little bit of a relief in that that gives me a little more time to pursue something else. Maybe I wasn't all that committed to the idea. I don't, at this point, I don't even remember what the idea was that got rejected. Um, And I think at the conference, I might've been doing other things. So it wasn't, it wasn't like I lost the opportunity to go to the conference because I wouldn't be presenting. It was just this one thing. Yeah. Um, So that certainly muted the disappointment. How, how, um, yeah, how inconsiderate of the muse to give you such an idea and then, <laughs> and yeah, then to have it rejected. It was crappy enough that it didn't impress somebody. I yeah, well, that. they weren't listening to the muse. So, yeah, um, they were. yeah. They were. you know, for me, uh, one of the more disappointing ones was one of the one of the topics that I was more excited about presenting. So and I, I really thought it was out of the box, um, which might have been the problem um, with with the audience. Um, but. I remember getting that and it was, it was myself and a friend. And so we got to commiserate about, uh, about that. And, but I, I also think there is some grief involved uh, when you put something and you've put, you poured yourself into lots of these things, whether it's an article or it's a proposal and not only the time, but also like the, uh, I think the, the energy and the passion and really what you're, you have coming back to you, especially something kind of final, like this didn't get accepted for a conference is, is, and I'll, I'll go back to what you said at the beginning is whoever somebody determined it, it didn't have value compared to some other things that, that were determined to have value. And, you know, that's a, that's a tough pill to swallow. Um, and you do have to have a stick to itness. You mentioned, uh, at the outset, um, different types of, of writing. And I wanted to add feedback in textbook writing is a little bit different than feedback for journal writing. So can we go that way? Yeah, let's go to textbooks. Okay, so textbook writing is an interesting, I'm going to say scholarship slash art form that does entail um, paying attention to feedback. You get feedback from a developmental editor who may or may not be a psychology person who doesn't may not have the content background that you have. You also have to deal with uh, the strategy that most major publishers use, which is to send pieces of your work out to reviewers that will give you comments about uh, whether or not what you're doing is on target or competitive or even something that they would adopt. And that is uh, a real challenge for textbook authors, in part because there's a prevailing belief that textbooks are pretty much all the same, and they're really not. The, there's a, a character difference in every textbook, if you look closely. Um, and reviewers tend not to be taking the perspective of what's in the best interest of the generic reader but what is in the best interest of how that individual person likes to teach the course. And so the feedback that they provide tends to be very idiosyncratic and sometimes, um, sorry, but laughable in that uh, people may want you to include in your textbook something that has no appeal at all for a general audience. So trying to figure out how do you straddle what your original vision is with what the publisher's minions are saying they want in your textbook uh, becomes a particular challenge. I don't think it has quite the same gut-wrenching impact that uh, an unfavorable review does for scholarship of teaching and learning or teaching of psychology, but the process of dealing with the feedback is um, Uh, certainly something that you have to be aware of if you're planning on going into textbook writing. It isn't just you and the publisher. There is 
a group out there that will be giving you some guidance, whether you choose to accept it or not. So that's just, I, I wanted to make sure that we talked about that. Well, and uh, I'll even say that we've put, we've done recent work. Uh, you were part of the team that did uh, the new student learning outcomes for Psych 100, and that was put out for review. So there's another uh, kind of example of something that can be put out for review. And one of the things that that I thought about when I read the reviews that came back is that um, reviewers, they may not understand, always understand what this thing is supposed to be. And uh, without the context, like I wished when I was, uh, and you know, I'm going to talk generally, but really I learned it from watching this process that it was my desire that this wouldn't happen uh, via email and written correspondence. I thought this, there are some conversations and some feedback that needs to be given within the context of a conversation where I, uh, things that can maybe not be articulated so clearly in, in, in text, or at least in an engaged way. What do you think about that kind of feedback? Wow, that's a really loaded question for me, given how many times I've been through APA governance kinds of things. Yeah. Um, but I do know from all of the experiences that I've had that when you're asking for APA approval at various layers and from various groups, it does mean that you have to vet your ideas, you have to listen to what people say, you have to figure out how to accommodate or if not accommodate, explain why you're not accommodating that point of view. It is a remarkably political, delicate process to be able to take the fundamentally good work of a group and get it all the way up to a positive vote on APA. Um, uh, I believe I've been through this maybe four or five times officially, and it's always painful, mm -hmm. <laughs> precisely for the reasons that you talk about, because the individuals who are in a position to approve are individuals who are remote from the purpose. And just as an example, the APA IPI outcomes that uh, I was part of uh, working on, the fact is I'm fairly sure that most of the individuals who are in a position of giving us a thumbs up or thumbs down don't have any connection at all to introductory psychology, except for maybe when they took it as an introductory psychology student. And so they may not be fully engaged, fully aware, uh, for example, of how incredibly diverse introductory psychology is in contemporary times. Is it an eight-week course? Is it online? Is it taught by an adjunct? Is it uh, thematic? Is it uh, focused on critical thinking? There are so many variables now that go into um, introductory psychology that we can't expect those in positions of power to, to understand that fully, mm -hmm. but it's uh, a hardship not to be able to transact that business face-to-face -to, -face to clarify and then deal with the fallout that happens from email traffic. It's, yeah, it's disheartening. Yeah. Well, and I think, again, I'm coming back to when somebody doesn't value the, uh, the hard work uh, and the vision that has been... Uh, that, that has been put into to something, um, especially when it's going to have such positive outcomes um, and, and especially when it solves a, a big problem. But uh, that 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 not share when when someone doesn't share the value of it, uh, it, it does. You know, that's feedback. Right. And and I wonder, um, as we're talking about writing and communication, um, and I, I don't want to talk about this issue or this particular um thing with APA, but, you know, it does have to come back to us when that feedback comes, even from reviewer two, um, is there something I could have done different to, uh, to make this more appealing? Um, and you actually mentioned a couple of things just now, which is, uh, you need to make sure that you, uh, you are, uh, vetting out your writing or your proposal or whatever with people who are going to eventually be looking at this or people like them who are going to be looking at this, that you can maybe even save yourself a lot of the pain of <laughs> negative feedback or critique. 
Agreed. Uh, I can tell a short story that illustrates some of the silliness involved. This is happened maybe 20 years ago. And I forget which set of standards it was that, uh, I think it might've been the first version of the high school standards. So 30 years ago, um, that in the process of approval, someone got up in the middle of an APA meeting and said, I can't support this document because the word family doesn't appear in it. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, the, the comment was so agenda driven that it was not relevant to what we were doing at the moment. And yet you still have to show respect, listen, go back to the drawing board and see, is there a place where family would be relevant? As it turned out, we did that and decided no. Um, and ultimately, we were able to come back on a second visit and get the document passed unanimously. But uh, the ordeal of dealing with people's individual agenda items that don't overlap well with what the purpose is, is uh, truly learning to do that is the art form of managing uh, APA politics. Yeah. Well, we have, uh, we've talked about how to uh, navigate uh, feedback and uh, what folks can do to uh, ensure that they I mean, we're not in control of everything, but con to control a little bit more about what kind of feedback we are going to get. I think you would agree with me that feedback is absolutely essential, um, that it's uh, it's important and that we need to, to uh, accept it. <laughs> I, I would, and I'd go so far as to say that at this stage of things uh, in my writing, I, I sometimes get a little disappointed if I don't get feedback in that I think people say, oh, well, Hallinan wrote it and she's been around forever, so this must be okay. And that may lead to maybe not quite as careful attention in feedback. Um, so there, I, I have learned that feedback is something that strengthens what I do. And while I may not welcome all of it, uh, the fact is if it makes my end product better, uh, I'm, I'm all for it. That's very interesting. Jane, if I had, if I was giving you feedback on something you wrote, I would not, I, I, I would fall into that trap for sure. Uh, so I don't know what you do about that. I'm well, shrugging I just my shoulders. I guess that's what I do about it. What do you do? <laughs> what did you say? I said, I, just, I, I guess I just keep publishing that if people <laughs> you know, don't pay attention and they don't give me feedback, then I'll publish it. And it may, might not be as, as tidy and lovely as it could be if, I've, if I'd gotten good feedback. Um, but uh, it, it is what it is. Yeah. Well, it's, I guess it's one of the downsides of being at the top, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, thanks for this. Uh, let's, uh, let's transition out of... Um, kind of a, a faculty focus and let's talk students that's coming up next. <laughs> 